crypto, blockchain, DAOs, smart contracts. What the heck is this? Am I even speaking English? Today on the Catholic Money Show, we are going to dive into this with our special guest, Matthew Pinto. Jonathan, great to be with you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it is a... I guess a pleasure. I don't know. I don't know if I'd say I'm starstruck, but maybe because I have a memory when I was, I think in probably eighth grade, getting ready for confirmation. I believe you spoke at a retreat that we had. I think it would have been at St. Joe's in York, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that, that, that would have been me. I spoke there. Scott Anthony, the youth minister, was a friend probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. It's all a bit of a blur, but I remember being at, in York because it's not terribly far from where I live. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's pretty awesome that you were there. I hope I didn't put you to sleep. No, I, 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 it was quite a while ago. <laughs> so I will, I'll be honest, say I don't know if I remember anything you said, but okay. I have a very clear picture of being there, of okay. listening to you. Um, like I remember kind of the general area, even of the, of the church that I was sitting in okay. and, uh, and remember thinking like, this is cool. Like this guy was pretty great. Okay. Uh, so well, it was definitely a positive experience. So thank you. Well, your kid, you're in the same camp as my kids because they often don't remember what I said. So, uh, <laughs> so those That's are not great. hard words. In fact, I have put audiences to sleep, John. Do you go by John or Jonathan? Uh, either one's fine. Okay, so John, I put audiences to sleep all across the country. So I would not, I would not be surprised if you were struggling as an eighth grader uh, in York, PA. No, it's great, and uh, so maybe I mean you've been all over the country. Maybe folks have seen you before, but I'm sure a, a number of them have probably heard of you. You wrote the book. Um, do Adam and Eve have belly buttons? I think that was very interesting to me when I was uh, when I was in eighth grade. I guess really quick, what is the answer? Ooh, well, uh, you know, it was the title of a book. It was a great title of the book. Did Adam mm-hmm. and Eve have belly buttons? And one hundred ninety nine like- other questions from Catholic teenagers. And then I proceed to let everyone down. I, I explain why it's a great theological question, what it means, how's it, how it would be connected. But, but really, I didn't give the answer. I said, you know, we just don't know. But I did, I did go on, John, to say that although you won't get the answer to that question, perhaps we should reflect on a more profound question, that if they did have belly buttons, were they innies or outies? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's good. Um, and, and of course, uh, you founded Ascension Press, which has done marvelous work uh, in the church and in the world. So, so many good things. And you have a new um, project, a new initiative that you're working on that I'm very interested in and why we're speaking today. It's the Catholic Crypto Conference. Tell us just a little bit about why why talk about crypto uh we'll get into what what is crypto and then why why talk about it as catholics why is this important why should we do and go into this so just start off really quick just kind of the basics uh, so we can get into this so slightly before the crypto conference um my new life post ascension ascension was unbelievable uh if everyone should get to live the life of the past 20 Mm -hmm. something years that i got to live in in founding and running ascension it was wonderful in in a hundred ways or more uh, so post ascension my new life john is something called the genesis group mm. uh, catholiccreation.com and the genesis group is a catholic incubator a catholic entity that creates and launches catholic entities and mm. i chose to to move first in the direction of the catholic crypto conference not because it was the best of the genesis projects that are coming up But it was timely and needed as evidenced by the last week, uh, an entity called FTX. Mm, FTX, man. Wow. It's a little bit like a Lehman (laughs) Brothers uh, collapse. And so my operating theory was twofold, uh, John. The crypto, blockchain, meta, Web3, NFT world is coming. It's a freight train. Mm -hmm. Whether it will dominate life like the internet is another question. But it's coming. And so Catholic business owners, ministries, dioceses, individual Catholics need to know about this, point one. 
Point two, I love the church. So anytime I say a little little tweak on the church, it's only said from a posture of love. Mm. Uh, I, I generally think in the mid-90s to the late 90s to the early 2000s that the church really didn't do much with the internet. Sure, we put up websites, but we didn't grab it by the throat like the secular yeah. world did. Mm-hmm. And so my operating principle and why I chose to kind of take this, this slightly edgy um, – idea of putting on a sizable uh, conference uh, with 35 speakers and more is because, John, I just didn't want us six or eight years from now to look back and say, you know, uh, we didn't do anything. Mm. And so uh, I knew that it would be seen in light of my reputation in the past, which was very meat and potatoes uh, with Ascension, that it would cause some questions. But once I started doing the media interviews and explaining what I shared with you, uh, one, we kind of miss the internet. Let's not mm-hmm. miss this. And two, maybe the second most important point, or the most important point of the whole interview, when I use the word crypto, John, uh, I use it like millions use it as a catch-all phrase, mm-hmm. not just cryptocurrency, which is controversial in, in some regards, but I'm talking about the whole space, which is about seven or eight big disciplines, namely Web 3.0, blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs. Uh, and and a metaverse and more. Yeah, yeah. If we could um, hop in, if I got a, just a clarifying question, and I've been trying to wrap my head around this, and I think it might be one of those things where it's tough. At least this is what I found. It's tough to understand it, or for me to figure out what it is, because maybe it's not quite here yet. But right, we had right the the internet, and I I've been on. I mean, I'm what am I? 36, but we had a, there was a computer in my house before I was born. Uh, I've been online for, for a very long time. I think I had my own website back when I heard you speak. Um, so I've been around and there was, right, we started with web 1.0, just static websites. They don't really change. You'd have to go in and edit, and edit them. Um, and even right. The, the, what was the, the, the content of it and the way it looked was almost together. And then we mm-hmm. moved into right web, web 2.0. We have more technologies now, right? We have JavaScript and cascading style sheets and all this. So the web can be more dynamic. And this allows um, projects and, and apps and websites like Facebook and Twitter and like social media to really take off because yeah. of the underlying technologies that uh, that make websites work these days. And we're about now to come into this, this new generation of it. Uh, so I hear Web 3, Web 3.0 all over the place. But what... What is that? What does that mean? Yeah. So if I only had one line to say, uh, it would be, and maybe I'll say two or three, but it, um, it is a decentralized web, mm. a di- more distributed web in the sense that ownership is not by a, quote, trusted authority mm-hmm. over above that. Now, you may distrust Facebook, but their technical name is a trusted authority. Yeah. So there's no real authority over it. The owners of the Web3 worlds mm. that we will uh, you know, presumably evolve into are, are distributed. And so you as a content creator, you're really holding up the network. You are mm. the owner. You own your own content. Uh, you, you, can, you can engage in your own kind of personal tokenization mm. where, where you can transact value. Um, you, may, you may know this, but maybe it'll sound familiar after I say it again, uh, say it to you is when you and I take our dollars, our fiat currency, and we buy something on Amazon, um, we're really transferring our dollars into a digital reality and then using that to transact on um, Amazon. Mm -hmm. But cryptocurrency and Web3 are native to each other. Cryptocurrency was created as a kind of native currency perfectly suited for Mm -hmm. the internet. Because it's digital from the word go, whereas your and my dollars are dollars first, yeah. then they're moved into digital. And so Web3 really is, is again, a, a more decentralized, more distributed. The, the content producers are the owners. Uh, many believe that it will mushroom uh, creation because it's almost open sourced in the sense mm. that if you write a program – uh, it's it's more likely that that program can then be built upon by others. So the contention is that this could create faster development uh, versus a centralized reality. Mm-hmm. And uh, what that means, John, is probably as unknown to all of us now 
as what it would have meant for me to have a conversation with you in 1995 when we started talking about the internet. None of us could have imagined mm-hmm. that I would end up with 5,000 songs on this device right here. Unbelievable. <laughs> Truly unbelievable. And all the other things that you and I have experienced, including this, you and I talking right now. Uh, over True. Years. So, so we don't fully know what it's going to be, um, but we do know it has this characteristic of decentralization, more ownership by the, by the content providers, and kind of a breaking of the trusted authority middleman. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the and, – and so, right, so, so as we go through this, we're going to run into some words – uh, I'd like to try to define them as best we can. Um, yeah. I know I have a, a decent grasp on some of this, and I imagine a lot of listeners, a lot of people out there, maybe have never even heard of some of these terms. So, um, so I feel like so a lot of this seems that it is this decentralized, this autonomous stuff. It's because of the blockchain. Which let me know if I've got this right. Yeah, the way that works. So right, the way you would think about something that works, right? If um, and just for an example, like cryptocurrency, right? Um, the way regular currency works, whatever, like my bank has the record of my bank account, right? This came in, this came out, and it's in that one spot, right? The file is saved in one spot. With the blockchain, that file is saved like all over the place. And those copies are all kept in sync. And then it's easy uh, to double check what's going on because I can check my copy. I can check your copy. I can check my neighbor's copy. And then that's why like with financial transactions, that's how you can't just go in and say, now I have $6 million because nobody else says that you have that. Yeah. 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 And in fact, the transaction will be rejected. I believe Uh, I'm learning as well here. And this Hmm. is, uh, and I say this all in all the interviews I've done uh, that um, I, to me, it was, whoa, this has massive potential. Hmm. I love the church. We have to have this conversation. In fact, that's the theme of the conference. Let the conversation begin. So I'm learning like you're learning. Now I've been learning aggressively for a year and a half, probably five, 600 hours of, of, of study. But yes, you described it. These are distributed ledgers. Hmm. And it's a bit mind blowing that um, the transactions are held on, on all these ledgers and they, they need to have consensus uh, in order to kind of accept transactions. And if there isn't consensus, the transaction gets rejected. So it's really locked down. In many regards, it becomes immutable. And that provides a lot of security. It'll, uh, there's no single point of failure. Um, there are hackings that can happen. I think they're going to be solved as time goes on. Uh, but it really is a new way of doing things. And we have a couple of speakers at the conference, John, that even in my prep with them and determining their topics, I've been like, wow, they, they, they start to describe all the different applications here. Ooh. So there was enough here where I thought, you know, let's not have this conversation six, eight, 10 years from now. Let's have mm-hmm. it now uh, mm-hmm. with all the appropriate disclaimers. And then, uh, then let's see what happens. But you basically described a distributed ledger that's whose power comes from the fact that it's distributed and it's uh there's consensus that authenticates and, and helps us to avoid a double spend. A double spend mm. is really what the traditional banking system gets away with, that I put a dollar in a bank, in a bank account, they lend it out to 10 mm. different people, uh, that fractional lending, whereas in the Bitcoin world in particular, it's one-to-one. You can't lend out that one Bitcoin to 10 different people. You know, it, it's, it's you are the owner of that. And that really becomes some of its power. Yes. <laughs> Unless you're FTX. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boom. boom. Uh, um, John, let me, let me build on that point real quick. So that this is one of the arguments against centralized mm. finance because FTX and a, a group called Celsius and a group called Voyager – They're operating in the crypto world, but it's still a centralized reality. So they could do behind the scenes what we think Wells Fargo or another bank could do. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. in in true decentralization, it's much more uh, a public record on the blockchain. Yeah, I'd say because – and again, I think this is how it is because a lot of this is so new. Um, We we are – users, um, we're trusting – these entities, right, whether it was FTX or or if it's Robinhood, whoever it is, like to hold our wallets, right? Your cryptocurrency is held in a wallet. And I'm saying like, I'm not going to keep this 
on my own computer. I'm not going to have a, my own little device for this. I'm just going to let you guys take care of it. Yeah. And yeah. then because of that, right, it's, it's still a bit centralized, right? They can, it seemed like it was the case with FTX. They're kind of poking in a little bit and using that money some, for something else. And so if in this true world of, of decentralization, we, and it, it's almost, it's kind of like, um, and we keep talking about cryptocurrency, but I know it's so much more than that, but it's like, it's, it's real electronic cash. Like I hold on to it. I keep it. And when I want to pay you for something, I just take it out and I hand it right to you. I don't yeah. have to, right. It doesn't have to travel on the visa network or any of that. Or, stuff. or even like when you send me $25 on Venmo, let's say it mm-hmm. feels like John has sent that to Matt directly, but no, you actually mm-hmm. send it for a third party Venmo. Whereas in the Bitcoin world in particular, and much of the crypto world, it is peer to peer. You you do own your own wallet. You you can park it off the grid if you so desire. And um, I mean, think about what people in the third world, the power that this gives mm. them in in countries where there's rapid you know inflation, hyperinflation. They can park their precious limited resources off the grid in a sense mm. and outside of the Argentinian you know dollar or whatever the uh, denomination would be down in Argentina yeah. and just like the african nation bypassed telephone poles and went right to mobile mm. uh, it's unbelievable what happened you know in in africa let's say 20 years ago where they just bypassed the infrastructure of telephone poles they went right to mobile phones mm. this is what we're talking about with your finances that you can actually kind of be in the system, but also off of the system. And that provides tremendous, uh, you know, in some regards, it's scary. And in other regards, it, it really gives great confidence. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity or a lot of, I mean, something's going to get blown up and change radically. We saw the power of peer to peer with, Napster, right back back in the day, this is right, right around probably the time again. I we, I saw you before was in, in, instead of going to the store, buying the CD, putting it in whatever, and listening to it there. And now, of course, we kind of see, and at least I have a much more formed conscience about all of this. Um, and the laws have caught up and all that. But it was like you just type in what you want, and there it goes. Yeah, you yeah. have it because. Those MP3s were on all these different people's computers, and then the bits and pieces of them come down to mine. And yeah. so we saw this revolution in the way we listened to, consumed, I think even thought about music, right? That the album, in many ways, is is something we hardly even think about. We think about the song, we think about the single. And yeah. that has been that's a change because of this technological um advance of this peer-to-peer technology, which is a big part of blockchain and everything else that that uh, produces and makes possible. And so it seems, it makes this total sense that because we're leaning into this and so many industries are are looking into this and trying to figure out how to harness this, right? It's like, we have this whole new, um, this is like, like our toolbox for like the internet just got opened up and we were just dumping in a bunch of new tools yeah, and we're going to figure out what they can build. Yeah. I mean, it's a great way to describe it. So two uh, points, maybe, maybe three, and I'll say them quickly. The word friction, you mm. with, with the Napster example, you just removed friction. You didn't have to go down to the store. Now this was yeah. illegal. Um, yes. but you, didn't have to, you didn't have to go down to the store and, and, and buy it. You were able to do it instantly. Now, those things worked themselves out. Napster was closed down, mm-hmm. but the principle is still the same, a frictionless uh, uh, system. So what people are contending is with these new tools of blockchain and crypto, you're, you're really removing a lot of friction from the system. And let me just give you a quick example. So there's a particular person in the space named Michael Saylor, and he speaks about Bitcoin a lot. And he, he said he, he transferred like a billion dollars. He's got a big company a billion dollars in Bitcoin, and he uh, transmitted it in a matter of minutes. And he said the cost was like $13. Hmm. He said, if I were to actually send a check for a billion dollars to Japan, or even $10,000 to Japan, it would have taken weeks. The fees would have been incredible, but Hmm. you remove all that friction. So that's, um, you know, that's one of the points we're talking about. But the second point is, this is why we say we don't fully know where this is going, but as Catholics, we need to be 
we need to have a heart and a mind that leans forward, meaning we have to have a hopeful expectation that these creations and human ingenuity are a bit of a spark of the divine. All human mm -hmm. uh, is kind of all human ingenuity is ultimately rooted in the creativeness of, of the Lord, creativeness of the Lord Himself. So we need to have a desire for it, but then we need to use prudence to to judge it and measure it. But very often we Catholics, and again, I love the church, um, so any tweaks are only said from that posture. But we Catholics often might operate from a paradigm of fear, where it's fear mm -hmm. first and then yes later. No, I think the Catholic response is yes first, tempered uh, and measured. Mm -hmm. But our impulse should be, what is God doing in the world? Because if these are powerful technologies, it needs to be a conversation the church needs to have, and the sooner the better – Mm -hmm. And uh, the church will figure this out, and the minds in the church, yours, mine, and uh, thousands of others, will figure it out. Yeah. I mean, it's like oh, it's any other technological advancement, right? It's like, oh, well, there's the radio now, or we got this thing called the television, or whatever it is. It's like, well, how can we use this to share the gospel, to continue to evangelize in those new ways? And I... I, we'll find out, right? And and I think it's also you talked about having you know prudence and 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 a, just the Catholic perspective on things. I think if you know what we see with Napster, right? This when peer to peer technology really kind of blossomed. If there were people probably involved, maybe a little bit more faithful or just a bit, had a clearer mind of how to think about things, there might have been you know, there might have been the thought of like, wait a second. If we're doing all this, sure, we get our, our music really easily. But it seems like this is this is robbing this person, right? It's we're we're taking away their ability to to create a living for themselves yeah, no from their no work. Doubt. So how could we think about this in a different way? Yeah, well, we have to discern those, but there are sometimes, and I would contend, like you would contend, millions of instances over the past thousands of years where people have created new technologies that didn't have those dilemmas that were just mm -hmm. new technologies. For example, someone figured out how to put these little side things on these glasses so they, they hold them on your ears. And that probably didn't harm anyone. Although yeah. most inventions probably do have some casualty uh, to them uh, in some limited way. But we just need to make judgment calls as to, A, whether it's immoral, the, the mm -hmm. change, and uh and then, you know, what type of other harm it may do. But, you know, the instinct to create, I believe, is 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 a spark of the divine. It doesn't mean that every creation is good, mm -hmm. but the instinct to create, I believe, is rooted in the giftedness that God has given us to have wills that can know and, and formulate. And uh, that creative instinct, I think, comes from the creator himself. Yeah, yeah. And just to, to have... Yeah, Catholics just uh, to think about this. Yeah, it's instead of kicking ourselves, right, and arriving in you know 2020, thinking how do we, you know, when 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 you can decide the discussion of of their decisions being right or wrong out outside of this, but right, like we can't go to mass. Um, what do we do? Right. And then, so everybody's scrambling about, well, how do we live stream? How do we do this? How do we do that? And it's like, this was, this is all technology that's been around for quite a long time. Like, you know, it was in some ways like a, a help. I was glad to see so many churches start live streaming or start podcasting their homilies or whatever it might be. But it's like, it took a pandemic to get us actually maybe step into the last decade and think about some of the technological innovations. And I, like you said, I don't want to be here. You know, I don't want to have to have a podcast episode with you in 2033 or 2043 and go, wow, if we would have just stopped and thought about this, if we yeah. could have figured out how to use all of this for the gospel and for the church and to serve yeah. What could we have been doing? I don't want to look back and kick ourselves. Yeah. So uh, two points. One, um, I've shared this in a number of interviews over the past couple of months leading up to the conference. Uh, John, I don't think I reflected five minutes philosophically on what the internet was for like mm. the first 10 to 15 years of its existence because I was busy building a business, busy, busy with kids. And, and I believe that if someone had 
grabbed me by the lapels and Bishop Johnson and Bishop Smith, I, I use this analogy in all the interviews, and said, yo, guys, you don't understand what's coming. I mean, this is mm-hmm. powerful. So so I, I really think that we owe it to ourselves to do this, even though we're uh, we're going to have 250 people and who knows how many on live stream, even though many of us will be reaching in the dark as we listen to the speakers and, and try and connect dots. Uh, it's a conversation that we should have. And, and I've, I've second guessed myself over these past six months in putting this together because it's been a ton of work. Should I have done this? Should we do this? And no, no, um, we should have done this. And, um, uh, so let's see how it comes out. I think I think it's going to be combustible. Uh, some of the some of the uh, emails and phone calls that I'm getting from people who are working in the secular world, mm. uh, who who are just so delighted to hear that that their day job can now marry their Catholicism mm. in this forum. So I think we're going to be putting together in the same room uh, finance experts, crypto experts, technology experts with philosopher, Catholic philosophers, theologians, and uh, pastoral leaders. And I think there's a good chance that we're going to come away with dozens and dozens of ideas for the church. This sounds fantastic. How do we get in that room? Okay. Well, uh, I'm I'm delighted to say um, that at the time of this recording, what's today, the Monday, the 14th, or mm-hmm. what's that here, uh, that, um, that we're we're within like 20 or so or, or less of remaining spots for the physical room, but we are doing a live stream, meaning pretty much 98% of the whole conference. Well, I think every one of the talks, and there's about 40 talks, um, they will be live streamed. And I think they'll be archived as well. Uh, okay. The group that we're working with, uh, Virtual Catholic Conference, I believe they, they archive them. And so you can experience the conference live or watch it later, okay. and uh, thanks to Virtual Catholic Conference and, and what they do. And uh, I think it's going to be a special event, and uh, a lot of good's going to come, I think, from it, John. Awesome. And when is the conference? Today is Monday. I think you're mm-hmm. airing on Tuesday, I think. Yes. Uh, so it's this Thursday and Friday, uh, November 17th and 18th. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, from I think eight thirty in the morning till five each day, and uh, should be really good. We're going to have up to four tracks uh, at any given time, and I believe the platform can handle three of them at once. And so the track that has the smallest number of talks, those will just be archived. I think the, uh, that track only had five talks, so you can see three tracks um, at any given time on the same computer. You just click from room to room and, and can go to them. From what I understand. Cool. This is great. And there, we have a link uh, in the show notes or in the video description about how you know, we can learn more about the conference, where you can grab a ticket. And uh, I'm excited to uh, to check out these talks. We're definitely going to be signing on virtually. Um, it's a little bit of a trip to get out there, but uh, there's no limit on the space for the virtual yeah. tickets. So check out the link down below or in the show notes to grab your ticket and learn more about the, the Catholic crypto conference and figure out what this could be, how we could use it and what the future might hold. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Matthew Pinto. It's been a pleasure and I really look forward to the conference and whatever might come of it. Thank you, John. And keep doing what you're doing. Uh, it's a blessing to the church. We need this Catholic worldview, uh, coloring uh, the issue of finances. Finances mm-hmm. has got to be a top three to five item in all our lives. Oh, yes. So uh, teaching us to be good stewards. You know, often in the Catholic world, you know this, I think we somehow think that money is dirty. No, it's more Mm. neutral. And in fact, you could be an extraordinary steward if one learns how to use that. So God bless you for what you're doing. Uh, I'm sure it's making a difference. Thank you very much. Have a good day. God bless you. Very good. Bye-bye.